I'm Sally Kornbluth, president of MIT, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to this MIT community podcast, Curiosity Unbounded. Since coming to MIT, I've been particularly inspired by talking with members of our faculty who recently earned tenure. Like their colleagues in every field here, they are pushing the boundaries of knowledge. Their passion and their brilliance, their boundless curiosity, offer a wonderful glimpse of the future of MIT. Today, my guest is Skylar Tibbetts, a designer and computer scientist whose research focuses on self-assembling and programmable materials, as well as both 3D and 4D printing. He is the founder of the MIT Self-Assembly Lab. So Skylar, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. I'd love to start by hearing you define a couple of the terms that run through your work, because they're not actually self-evident to <laughs> yep. uh, some of us. The first is 4D printing, which is arguably what you're best known for. So can you define for our listeners yep. and for me what that actually means? Sure. So we called it 4D printing because we want to take 3D printing and add the element of time. So for you know, yes. referencing time, but we want to 3D print things that transform over time. They evolve, they reconfigure, they, they're they very lifelike. And it started with this dream of, can we print something that would walk off the machine? How okay. would you do that? No motors, no electronics, similar to a robot, but purely material. And the machine could produce that. So we called that 4D printing and it was in 2012 or 13. And now that's grown to many other things, different materials, different machine processes. I'm curious what are the features of the material that allow that? And is it sometimes in response to changing environmental conditions or stimuli, or is it somehow intrinsic when you set up the initial print? Most of our work is about response to the environment. And we try to do that through temperature or moisture or pressure or wind or waves. And the mechanism often is two different materials. It could be more Sometimes you could do one, but the easiest is you have at least two different materials that have very different properties. So one is going to expand or contract, and that causes it then to curl or to you know shrink or do something, fold. And you can use that as a mechanism. When you print it, you can then deposit different material properties with different geometries and three-dimensional structures. But you can also do the same thing with knitting. You can do it with weaving. You can right, do you know, right. all sorts of other manufacturing processes. And it's really about combining those material properties in the right three-dimensional structure in response to some kind of activation. I see. I yeah. see. Interesting. So can you give some kind of example of an everyday system that could benefit from this sort of technology? Yeah. About half of our work right now is in textiles, actually. And okay. so we're doing exactly that with fibers and yarns, industrial knitting, everything from dresses to shoes to jackets to swimsuits. And there's really two reasons you would want that in clothing. The whole apparel industry and wearables industry is trying to make smarter clothing, but most of that is focused on sensors right, and more right. devices in that. In our case, we're trying not to have sensors and motors and stuff in your clothes. You don't want to charge your shoes at <laughs> yes, night, right? Yes. So it's material driven. Um, and there's two main reasons. One would be tailoring. So customized for fit or customized for style. Oh, and that's pretty interesting. And so it autonomously tailors or can get a perfect fit for your body or my body. But the second one is usually climate or moisture regulation. So, you know, we have a project right now about insulation, adaptive insulation that basically keeps you cool or warm when you need it. Same thing could happen for moisture regulation or think about compression garments, like adaptive compression in apparel. So basically they're always adapting to how you're living or the environment around you or how you're performing. It seems to me that this could also have medical device applications. Yep. In other words, adaptation to physiological circumstances. Yep, exactly. And the compression is a, is a great yes. example. And we've yes. done some work in that area, a little bit in prosthetics, some early work on orthodontics. So there's some. I wouldn't say our lab is like heavily yes. in the medical space, but you, we've done a little bit and you can see there's a lot of applications there. Very interesting. So what do you actually think the future then is if you're kind of looking where your lab might go, what other sort of arenas are you interested in and others may be interested in 4D printing? In terms of the applications of it, my lab works across many different disciplines from like, yeah, footwear and apparel to aviation, automotive, oh, manufacturing, architecture and construction. I'm faculty in architecture. So we work across many and we think about it as like, systems, behaviors, phenomenon that can then be applied at different scales, at different domains. But I think the longer vision is that right now, we're, we all want the smart 
XYZ, smart home, smart car, right. smart shoe, smart whatever. And that's all very device heavy. I think over time, it'll get more and more elegant and it'll be more about material properties and our environments. And we'll still have the smartness, but they'll be more and more simple and seamless. Interesting. And that likely makes them more lifelike. I mean, we're all smart right, without right, right. devices. So <laughs> right. our products and environments will become smarter and smarter, but more and more material. Plus, presumably, it'll be potentially easier to scale and more affordable. Exactly. That's one of the key benefits. Less assembly, less energy intensive, less failure, yes. less components, you know, all that kind of stuff. Very interesting. Yeah. You know, I've seen some self-assembly structure videos. So that helps make the concept of self-assembly really vivid. And, you know, as a biologist, I always think about this. The old, you know, if you take a sponge and you dissociate the cells and, you know, separate them, they can self-assemble into an organism. Can you talk a bit about self-assembly, how you define it, and how do you compare it to sort of traditional assembly methods? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think about self-assembly as disordered parts that build an ordered structure without humans or machines. So you have a bunch of components, Legos, bricks, cells, you know, whatever it is. They should be able to organize themselves, ordered structure, maybe that's function, behavior, design, without us guiding it, like screwdrivers, drills, printers, or without robots or something else doing it. It should be able to do that on its own. Most of the time, you see that in biology, chemistry, material science, at very small scales. And frankly, that's usually, when I say self-assembly, either people think I mean IKEA, and yes, I yes, don't mean yes. like literally you are the self-assembling. Or they're from biology, chemistry, material science. And they're like, yeah, self-assembly. I know about that. But most other people don't really think about that. And at yes. the human scale in manufacturing construction, that's almost non-existent. We don't use self-assembly in construction and manufacturing typically. But when you go above that, think of like geological or planetary scale. Self-assembly yes. is the only mechanism. Exactly. The planets form themselves. Yes, you know? exactly. So that was the question of like, why don't we use that as humans? Like mm -hmm. that's another possible way to build things. And so my lab focuses on macro scale self-assembly, mostly for construction. And now we have a big project in the Maldives trying to grow islands using self-assembly. Oh, that's really interesting. So the intrinsic properties of the system or the material to self-associate, you capitalize on that. Exactly. Yeah, it's usually you have some material component that could be yes. sand or that could be yes. blocks or Legos or whatever it is. They need some kind of stickiness, but that needs to be patterned. Yes. So it can't just yes. be everything sticks to everything. And then you need just the right amount of energy. Too much, it usually breaks yes. apart. Not enough, it doesn't assemble. And if you get those right, that can happen at any scale with any component. Yes. And then order can No, that's emerge. great. Yeah. So... You know, in terms of thinking about the self-assembly, how do you predict sort of its future impact on manufacturing? You know, we're starting to rethink manufacturing in the U.S. in terms of, you know, robotic input and how the labor force is changing and what expertise is needed. Do you yep. actually see this as a sort of viable, scalable future manufacturing process? You're seeing that starting to happen, especially in material science, starting also in like chip and electronics, like small scale components yes. where there's complexity. It's hard to get robots, hard yes. to get people. You're seeing it emerge in that space, but, you know, wider spread manufacturing. I would hope so, but I will say that for the past 10 years or so, we didn't think of self-assembly as really applied. It was basic research to us. Like Got it. We were Got like, it. is this possible yes, in the beginning? Yes. You know, what can we do with this? What if we change the number of components? What if we change the geometry so it's not always deterministic? It becomes non-deterministic yes, yes. and designs emerge. We had so things you might in get tumblers. Different outputs. Yeah. Oh, we had a tumbler where parts learn to fly essentially because they would come together and the ones that were good at hovering, they, you know, evolved this mechanism of hovering and the other ones broke. That's crazy. Things like that. <laughs> I like it. But the Maldives project became very applied. And that's yes. where it sort of skipped over factories for a second and you know, thinks about geology yes, in a way, like yes. landforms that already self-assemble, we kind of think about them as either we sculpt it and we like move like geoengineering right. and move right. earth, or we're just like erosion happened. I don't know what to do, but there's another option, which is sort of dancing with the forces of nature and saying, let's try to promote something to happen naturally. And, you know, we usually think those things on geologic time frame, things that are yeah. changing geologically. So, you know, when you do something like this, what sort of time frame does this yeah. these kind of projects operate under. 
In the Maldives, it's uh, there's a lot of sand and it moves very quickly. So, okay. you know, on the order of weeks to months, wow. a sandbar will form that's above the surface of the water, like a full on island, and locals will go and have a party or wow. you know, have a reunion. Uh-huh. So it's very, very fast. You know, longest time frame there is one season. And we're really trying to compete against dredging. We're trying to eliminate I dredging. See. I see. Or basically barriers to try to fight nature. Those are like the two right, things right, that people right. think of. Pump sand or build walls and block right, nature. Right. And we're trying to show that you can let nature build things by helping guide it. Guide where the sand goes. You can't sculpt it, but the sand can naturally accumulate. And so you're kind of up against how fast can they pump an island. And yes. that is usually on the order of months. But you know, we think within a season, you can get the same amount of accumulation naturally. Very, very interesting. I mentioned early on in the conversation, you're sort of a designer and computer science. And do you think of yourself more as one or the other? What's the interplay there? Definitely more on the design side. You know, I came from a background of artists. I studied architecture originally. You know, I'm much more designer than I am computer science. And, and frankly, I don't really do much in computer science. I have a degree in it. You know, we write code and we, you know, have that as a background. But most of our work is not software driven and computing in like the traditional sense. But you can see a lot of that mentality of computation is embedded in our work. And so, you know, I got into computing because of design and software was just booming at that time, you know, a few decades ago. And I started writing code to create new tools for design. And so I kind of came in through the lens of design, but I was much more interested in like, what are the fundamentals of computing? Like literally what is information and how does one thing communicate to another thing and like information theory and how do we transfer information into physical objects and how do we use information? How do we program materials? Like that's the kind of computing that we do, you know, although we do also traditional computing and coding, but definitely the lab is design meets computation science engineering rather than science engineering first has a little bit of design. We're the other way around. It's interesting as you talk about computing and also it sounds analogous to me to the notion of how do you sort of make the whole greater than the sum of the parts? In other words, what are the modules you need to create what you're going to do and what makes new emergent properties? Yeah, totally. What's the most fundamental, simple amount of information that can lead to the maximum diversity of options? And for design, that's awesome. You can have simple building blocks or I can have simple rules or precedents. And that can lead to many different creative outputs. That's like the holy grail. Yeah, exactly. You know, we hear a lot about design thinking in education Mm -hmm. and how we teach our students design thinking that's applicable to all different fields. I'm just wondering how you think about that in terms of how you teach that and how people change their mindset when they come in with a, a sort of design lens. Yeah. And I teach a studio called How to Design, okay. like literally How to Design. And it came out of a, a very famous historic class at MIT called How to Make Almost Anything. Yes. And Neil Gershenfeld yes. teaches that. And then we created a section called How to Design because we thought like we also need to talk about that and not just right. making for making. Like how right. do we literally design the things we want to make? So every week we go through one step of the design process. Like what is a concept? What is representation? How do I represent ideas? What does iteration do for the design process? We go through testing, fabrication, presentation, you know, all these different aspects of design. And that is for any MIT undergraduate across the campus that is interested in design. That started to then boom, and we have a design minor. So any student on campus can be a major in anything, physics, biology, math, whatever, and then they can have a minor in design. And now we have a major in design, so they can be an MIT design major or double major. And it was all about trying to create a very different perspective on design. You know, we're not a traditional design school. Like there's very strong design schools around the world. But how do we create like polymath designers that are physicist designers and biological designers and mathematician designers and engineer designers, like these hybrid creative technical right brain, left brain kind of ethos. And MIT is like the perfect place for that, that we can mix the creative with the technical. So those studios, we teach the design process, but then, you know, they're also building materials and machines and they're testing and they're thinking about like one of the assignments is called the physics fabricator. Take a principle from physics and use that to build something. And so they think about like double pendulums and chaotic systems that can fabricate 
parts better than something else, you know, or like dropping things or spinning things or like some principle in physics. So we try to think of the MIT ethos as a design generator and amplify all their technical pursuits as well as their creative, like bring those two together. Oh, very interesting. So, you know, I was going to ask you how you came to MIT. It sounds like MIT is the perfect environment Mm. for your work, but how did you find your way here? Yeah. So I studied architecture in Philly. I have a five-year professional degree. And as I was saying, at the end of that, it was just right as computation was coming on board yes. and changing that discipline. Well, I started by hand drafting, yes. you know, and then it got to CAD. And then it's like, okay, let's generate our own software tools. And fabrication was just booming. Like we didn't even have printers or anything at the school. So I started getting into code for software and code for machines and then applied for grad school. I applied for a bunch of places got into a number of them at the very last second, got into MIT. I was uh-huh. like, okay, that's, that's I'm it. going there. Yeah. I'm going yeah. there because I want to learn computation from computer scientists, not from architects. Yeah. I felt like I had a strong design background and I want to go, you know, I was taking classes with Minsky and Patrick Winston and, you know, these pioneers of AI yes. and, and computation. And then I could use that and translate it back to design. And the design minor, when we first created that in 2016, that boomed to become the second or third most popular minor. It kind of oscillates right there. So it just exploded. We realized all these students want to take design. And then I think partly because of that and other forces of design happening around campus, Morningside was created. And that's really become the hub for design on campus. And, And I direct our design minor and major programs in our department. And then I lead the academic part of Morningside Academy for Design. I think about the Academy for Design as a way to connect all of the efforts across campus in design, whether that's undergraduate education, like I've talked about, graduate education, research, even K through 12 outreach, yes. entrepreneurship meets innovation. Yes. Like, how do we use design as a way to amplify all the other things that are happening? Create a hub, bring students there, take classes, do your ops, research help them with portfolios, getting jobs outside afterwards so that they are both like the creative and the technical, which is super rare for a student to have that. So anyway, the Morningside Academy is is really trying to amplify and connect across campus design. And historically, I don't think MIT is thought of as the center of design. Sure, right? sure. Similarly in arts, but we have such a strong history in arts and design. Yes. We're the first architecture school in the country. We've yes. been number one for a long time. Like we have a really strong design program, but more than that, I think we just have a very different perspective on design yes. that not a lot of traditional design schools have. And I think that's like a perfect match for our MIT undergrads, the creative and the technical. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You talked about right brain, left brain, and, you know, a lot of people with sophisticated quantitative skills don't think about design. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people go into design, never delve into the arena of, you know, sophisticated mathematics or computation. And to get those in the same students, as you say, will create a sort of unique person to go out into the workforce. And it shouldn't just be like, let's solve the problem any way we can, or let's just make things beautiful, which are kind of the cliches of engineering and and design. But how do we imagine a future that isn't possible today and have the skills to both like design it, test it, build it, prototype it, communicate it? Like that whole process is what we need to combine. So, you know, in terms of your perspectives, you have a family history in art and design. Mm -hmm. Uh, I understand your grandfather was an architect. Did that in some way inspire you, even, you know, starting at a young age to move towards design? Certainly. And at first, I wanted to be an artist or maybe a photographer. And you can probably see some of that come through in our work, Uh you know, the way we shoot photo or video of it. But at some point, I just remember thinking that, oh, architecture, that's a practical art form. Like, I could have a career in art through architecture. You know, I've definitely gone more on the artistic side and and being at MIT allows me to like blend those things as we we're talking about. And I, you know, I don't practice architecture and build buildings in a traditional way. I run a research lab, but I think that ethos of like imagining and creating and discovering and playing like that is definitely built in. And then there's different tools. And sometimes that's computation and sometimes that's a paintbrush and sometimes right. that's, you know, something else. But we can be creative through many different tools and many different disciplines. So in your spare time, which you probably don't have much of, do you actually do art as part of your slate of hobbies and interests? 
Um, not so much art anymore. I used to be really into drawing and at some point I was painting and I built a lot of stuff, but now it's been much more like photo video I and see. I've been into like drone photography oh, and video stuff. We got into that through our work in the Maldives, like yes. flying drones. And so now that has been my creative outlet to, you know, just use the camera as a lens and to see things in a different way. And that translates to how we document our work as well. Like, Think about the self-assembly we're talking yes. about. It's really hard, even just right now, to imagine what I mean without seeing it. And then even while you're seeing it, we're always thinking about how do I film this so that it can communicate what's happening so that anyone can see it right away and understand how this happened or what's possible with it. Like So the filming, the visual aspect of it is just as important in the storytelling. So you have two young children, mm -hmm. five and almost one. Yeah. And, you know, it, it must feel your work has a kind of big arts and craftsy class yeah. kind of feel to it. Do you share your work on some level with them? Yeah. And my daughter thinks we are a toy store or a toy factory. She comes to my lab <laughs> and thinks that we make toys. I mean, we make a lot of things that look like toys are fuzzy and fluffy and squishy and, you know, interesting shapes and colors and stuff. So for the first time this past weekend, she said, Papa, can we 3D print something? Oh, fun. So she's starting to think fun. about that you can make something. So I'm super excited about that. You oh, know, before great. that, it was more like, do you want to make this thing? But now she's starting to ask me. So, oh, that's yeah. And she's on campus. She goes to daycare here. Both of them do. And once a week, I try to take her out for lunch and we just explore campus. Like we wander through the oh, that's tunnels. Yes. We went to the glass lab. You know, we wander into maker spaces. And so I'm hoping some of that like creative, technical part of MIT, the curiosity starts yes. to come through. But we'll see. It's so funny how these things sort of get internalized by your kids. So my son's a PhD student at MIT, but I think both for his childhood and many of my friends who were scientists, I think kids just thought, you know, having a lab was sort of a rite of passage. Yeah. You know, you would reach a certain age and you would acquire a lab. Yeah, you know, exactly. it's just sort of... Everyone's you, got a lab, That's right? what everybody does, <laughs> yeah, you know? Exactly. And some of them stay that course and some of them do something yeah. different, but... You're definitely influenced by your parents' professions. Um, I had two psychologist parents, so I went the complete opposite direction go. than that. <laughs> there you go. Well, my mom was an opera singer. Oh, wow. And, you know, the farthest I went with that was, you know, a cappella singing in college. That's, yeah. that's a, you have to actually have the talent to be an <laughs> opera singer, which was certainly yeah. an impediment. So you have young children at home. You have the pressures of co directing a lab teaching, managing your undergraduate programs. You have a huge amount on your plate. You know, I find like, coming up with new ideas actually requires some mental space. Mm -hmm. You know, when do you, when do you have creative time? How do you think about it? You know, is it, do you go running? Do you, do you carve out time to think carefully about things? I'm just curious. One is the plane. Okay. So traveling and the plane has become like a really good space for that. Like, just stare out the window. Yes. You can't move for however many hours. And don't sign up for the internet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, your battery only lasts so long and you just, my mind starts to wander yeah. and you just yes. start to imagine and like things start to connect. So that has, you know, historically been a really great place for that. I come back from trips with a million new ideas and come into the lab. But the other thing is that I just have an amazing lab full of amazing people, like super yes. creative, talented. Yes. You know, and if anything, at this point, I set the vision and do fundraising and management, but they have, you know, way more talent than yes. I ever did. And so just hanging out with them, especially during IEP or the summers, and I can spend like a lot of time in the lab, yes. hanging out with them is super inspiring. And it's like, oh, you did, oh, we should do this. You guys did this together. Okay, here's a new, you know, yeah. and a lot of ideas are generated from that, just bouncing ideas off the people in the lab. But my own quiet time. You know, it's either like the shower or the drive yeah, or, the, right. or the plane was a really good one. To me, the most fun thing about having a lab was just what you're saying, which is just seeing the excitement, looking at the ideas, looking across the scope of the lab and thinking about novel combinations yep. and just, you know, sort of harnessing that creativity yep. and excitement of the collective is so fun. And especially our undergrads, we have research scientists that are amazing, PhDs, master students are like super talented, super passionate. But our undergrads come from all across MIT, everything brain and cog to computer science and materials design, you know, everything you can imagine. And there's just something different about their excitement, their knowledge, like there's something really enjoyable about that energy. 
in the lab. And if you combine that with this like deep skill and creativity yes. that the yes. upper level experienced researchers have, like pretty awesome things emerge. Yeah. I mean, I think that that captures extremely well sort of the magic of MIT. Yeah. Brilliant people, interdisciplinarity, and sort of, yeah. you know, what you can get magically when you yeah. throw people together. And I've always thought about the grad versus undergrad culture as like two very different things. When they work together, it's super powerful, but the yes. undergrads are just like pure brilliance and energy, creativity and technical expertise. The grads, you know, and I say this for myself, but we worked hard and proved ourselves, but maybe aren't like just the most purely brilliant X, Y, Z, but we like really worked hard and have gotten somewhere because of that. But when you combine those two, you know, that's super powerful. There's also the pressures, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like you're looking for a particular career outcome when you're a graduate student or a postdoc. You have some freedom to explore, but yeah. there's like a little pragmatic, you know, yeah. thing ringing in your head. Yeah. So it is nice to have this kind of unconstrained, like what would be the most cool thing to do? And sometimes the brilliance of not being the expert or having knowledge right. in some other domain right. that inspires the people that are deeply right. knowledgeable. In that. Right. You're yeah. not constrained by what you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, I've really enjoyed our conversation. This is an area that I have not gotten a lot of a chance to think about before. So I really enjoyed that. And I'm sure our audience is going to feel exactly the same way. So let me just thank you again. Pleasure. And say to our audience, thank you for listening to Curiosity Unbounded. And I very much hope you will join us again. I'm Sally Kornbluth. Stay curious.